I would start by stating the obvious. I think that we are at a very difficult, somewhat perplexing, and potentially perilous transition point in American foreign policy. We are still the strongest country in the world by any metric. So by the measure of political influence, by our economic weight in the world, by our military power in the world, and by our cultural strength. Silicon Valley is a part of that. Our constitution as amended is part of that. Martin Luther King and the civil rights struggle is part of that. So we're a consequential country. And I would say, without any question, the strongest global power now and for the next several decades. But we are being challenged because in absolute power, we're uncontested, but our relative power is diminished from what it was in 1950 when we accounted for 50% of global GDP, from what it was at the very end of the Cold War, December 25th, 1991, when the Soviet Union crashed. We were more powerful then relative to other actors in the world than we are now because our power is being contested. It's being contested by a much more assertive Russia in Europe, and we've seen that in the annexation of Crimea, in the division of Ukraine, in the threats to the Baltic countries. It's being contested by a rising China. And there's no question in looking at the, the very consequential presidency of Xi Jinping that the Chinese leadership, and particularly the People's Liberation Army, are pushing out. They're pushing out and flexing their muscles and contesting the power of friends of the United States and even of the United States Navy and Air Force in the South China Sea and in the East China Sea. We're also burdened by a weakened Europe. I talked about December 25th, 1991, the emergence of a united Europe in the words of President George H.W. Bush and his compatriots, Cole and Mitterrand and Thatcher. Europe was finally in 1991 whole, free, and at peace. Everything it had not been uh, for centuries. 2016, is Europe whole when Putin has redivided it? Is it free when some of the countries in the eastern part of Europe uh, look more like fascist countries than democratic countries? Think of Hungary in that respect. Uh, is it at peace uh, when we find Europe unsure of its future direction, when it's contested by a refugee crisis and a Eurozone crisis and the Putin crisis and maybe even a crisis concerning Angela Merkel's power? Uh, if she's going to last in power throughout this year. So we have to face a new set of problems, particularly with Russia and China, at a time when Europe is at its weakest point in the last 25 to 30 years. In our hemisphere, we see a prostrate Brazil, a country whose economy is going to decline by 3 to 4 percent this year, going through its own constitutional crisis, where not just the president, but the f uh, may well be impeached by both houses, but the former president may well be indicted, and the Speaker of the House and the Vice President could face charges, the entire leadership of the country. We have in India a newfound friend and strategic partner. I was in Delhi and Mumbai last week, and I was impressed by the strategic clarity of Modi, Prime Minister Modi. Unlike all of his predecessors, going back to 1947, he seeks singularly the strongest possible strategic partnership with the United States because he sees what we see the need to balance China in the uh, Western Pacific, in East Asia. And yet India is years away, maybe even decades away, from truly being a great power and being able to wield authority in the way that we would like it to as India's friends because of their massive internal challenges that we face. But I think we're burdened not just in our global policy by all of those trend lines. I think we're burdened by doubts from within here in the United States. Our public, 315, 20 million people that are burdened understandably, tired from everything that's happened since 9-11. The two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, deeply unpopular, especially the war in Iraq. To borrow a phrase from John F. Kennedy, our long twilight struggle from terrorism because that long war may persist well into our children's adulthood and professional lives. A public that's understandably worried more about what's happening here in the country than overseas. Because they worry about inequality, and that's been present 
in both parties, but especially the Democratic Party and the Democratic primaries, by a hollowing out of the middle class, by a return to racial tension and racial strife that I think a lot of us hope we had put behind us but has resurfaced in every part of the country, in communities, concerns questions about policing and the law and the rights of African Americans. And if you look at our political spectrum, and the Sanders candidacy and the Trump candidacies illustrate this, we see on the left, the extreme left of the Democratic Party, a return to isolation and protectionism. And I'm not quite sure what we're seeing on the right. If it's Ted Cruz and especially Rand Paul, we're seeing isolation in the Tea Party. With Donald Trump, who knows? If you listened, as I did, to his foreign policy speech the other day, entirely uncertain where the foundation stones are in his own internal thinking. But I think we've benefited over the last 25 or 30 years from a strong center, from a strong center left. People like uh, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, from a strong center right, people like George W. Bush and Condoleezza Rice and Mitt Romney and John McCain. Our leadership tends to come from the center left and center right, but right now the noise is being made and many votes being earned by the far left and the far right. And as a foreign policy person, that worries me because a return to isolation and a return to protectionism, in my judgment, would be ruinous for our global interests and the pursuit of those interests successfully. So in a way, we might look at our political leadership in Washington. It's clearly dysfunctional in the red-blue divide in the United States Congress. We finally had an, our American ambassador to Mexico uh, voted upon her nomination ratified last evening after nearly a year of struggle between the two political parties and what country is more important to us than Mexico. We haven't had an ambassador there in a long time. It took almost a year to get Roberta Jacobson appointed. One of the presidential candidates this week, and I think you know who I'm going to talk about, promised to smash every foundation stone of American foreign policy that we've laid since before the end of the Cold War and since. Now, I'm not up here to defend everything that's happened over the last 30 years. I'm quite willing to point to five or six major cataclysmic failures of American policy, starting with the Iraq War in 2003. But to assert, as Donald Trump asserted the other day, that the entire history of America's involvement over the last 30 years has been an absolute failure, and that is what he literally said. He didn't just imply it. He said it, that the actions of every Secretary of State and every Secretary of Defense, that of our presidents, Republican and Democrat, have failed us, is just pure sophistry. And then to say that he alone, and these were his words, not mine, he alone could resolve the problem. Contrast that with the other candidate, and I promise not to be too overtly political in these remarks, who is experienced, who is tough-minded, who has a sense of how to negotiate her way in the world and how to wield American power. This is a very consequential election for us in terms of foreign policy, not just domestic policy. And I worry about a collective national loss of self-confidence in our global role, which would be roiled by one of the candidates and I hope would be fixed in part by the other. So given the vast power that we exercise in the world and given the self-interest we have in being integrated with the world in a globalized 21st century, I don't think there's anything more important than rediscovering a self-confident path ahead whether we're Democrats or Republicans is immaterial for the United States as the world leader. The Republican word to express this is that we are an exceptional power. And the Democratic word to express this as, is that we are an indispensable power. And we are both. And I don't mean that to sound arrogant. We obviously have to work, especially in the 21st century, in concert with every other power in the world, particularly on those issues that transcend well, that cover every country in the world. But there's no question that we're the dominant country and that we have to lead. So with that as prologue, uh, I see five tests ahead for our president. Now, it could be 10, it could be 15, it could be 25. It surely is. 
But I sat down and thought about this talk today and thought about what it would like to be um, in the room when the next president uh, comes into the Oval Office and looks at that awesome inbox filled with national security challenges on her desk, or possibly his desk, uh, in the Oval Office. So I thought maybe five big priority tests. The first is how to juggle and how to prioritize what I think is clearly the most complex foreign policy inbox that any president will have, have experienced and have faced in our memory and probably the memory of everybody in this room. And just to put that into context, I'm not saying this is the most fateful time in American history, because it isn't, because the revolution 241 years ago, it began in outside of Boston and Lexington and Concord. That was the most fateful time we've ever faced. It's certainly not the most dangerous agenda, because that would have been the two-front war, 1941-1945. But in terms of complexity, the multiplicity of issues that we're facing, both bilaterally and multilaterally, I think this is the most complex time. What's in that inbox? Well, a series of transnational issues, so issues that are flowing under our border, over them, through them, um, that threaten uh, our way of life. Certainly in global climate change, that threaten our environmental future, the future of the planet. In terms of the security of women and children, the, the trafficking of women and children in every continent of the world, uh, the drug trafficking and criminal gangs that are now a multinational business, and some of our people are involved in that. The series of cyber challenges, whether it's cyber espionage or the elements of cyber warfare that we need to prepare ourselves for in cyber defense, to cyber threat theft of people's individual intellectual property, banking information, through the organized theft of that information, through pandemics and the Zika virus and Republicans and Democrats are debating whether or not we should be prepared and whether or not we should put some money behind being prepared. That's the big debate in Washington this week, is an example of that. Of course, global terrorism. And we've seen, particularly in the Horn of Africa and in the Levant region of the Middle East, now a, a, the terrorist threat metastasize into East Africa, Central Africa, certainly across the Sahelian belt, all the way across <coughs> Africa to Mauritania, and now into Libya, where the Islamic State, based in Raqqa, Syria, occupying Mosul and Iraq, controls 180 kilometers of the southern Mediterranean coastline in Libya itself. And then, of course, the complex that people at CSAC um, focus on, many people at CSAC, the complex of nuclear and biological and chemical threats that pose, in a way, an existential threat to the United States. It's work that Dr. Perry has done um, throughout his career to help us understand that threat and cope with it. The common denominator here is that on, in this transnational basket of issues, the United States cannot be successful if we face any of these problems alone. And we certainly can't be successful if we are isolated, if we're pulling inwards, if we're digging a moat around the country and pulling up the drawbridges. And on the extreme left and on the extreme right, there are elements of that attitude as we confront this awesome series of challenge, challenges in our next president's inbox. Steve Krasner and Amy Ziegart led a Hoover study about our national security interests that was just published when I was arriving here in January. And one of the conclusions that they came to is that if you think about all these threats, how do you prioritize them? They said it boils down to the existential threat we face from WMD, from nuclear, biological, and chemical proliferation in the world, especially to states like North Korea or groups like the Islamic State or the Al-Qaeda affiliate groups. I think they're right about that. And so if you want to prioritize, you might start there. Secondly, they also said that they thought there were two states that had a sufficient power to contest the will and the interests of the United States. And of course, those two states are Russia in Europe and potentially China uh, in East Asia. If this new president wanted to prioritize among all these problems that I've listed, and I've just 
given you the top of the inbox, I think you start with WMD and you start with Russia and you start with China. That's the first test. To figure out in the first 100 days or 1,000 days where the bulk of American strategic attention and where the bulk of the president's attention should be. Second test is how to build upon Barack Obama's legacy. When Condi uh, Rice was Secretary of State, um, I remember in 2008, she would talk about the passing of the baton. And we didn't know in early 2008 who was going to be elected president in November 2008. But she said quite correctly that we do have this tradition. And it's built into the Constitution. It's built into the fabric of our political life. Uh, think of the transition of power as a relay race around an oval track. And one runner hands the baton to the other. Um, there's no question that the United States, uh, the next American president, is going to have to build off the legacy that President Obama has left. And in this respect, I profoundly disagree with the way that both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump have talked about the United States on the campaign trail. From left and from right, here's the image that they, are, have, they have depicted in their campaign speeches and appearances. The United States is failing. The United States doesn't succeed anymore. The United States never wins anymore. The United States is being outpaced or outnegotiated by all of its adversaries. Or the United States is the guilty party in most of the crises in the world today. We're overly militarized. We're too engaged. We've overused the military. Now, there may be elements of truth uh, in some of that criticism. But I guess I don't recognize the country that they're talking about. Because I said before at the beginning, by any metric, the United States is still the dominant country in the world politically, economically, militarily, culturally. Our, as Steve and Amy pointed out in their Hoover study, our value system of democratic government and free market government is ascendant and is largely unchallenged with the end of communism. No major imminent existential threat, say Steve and Amy in their Hoover study. Uh, Donald Trump says we don't win anymore. Consider the following Barack Obama successes for the United States. The global economic recovery. He took office during the worst recession in 75 years. He helped, and he was the singular figure, to bring the United States as the world's largest global economy back to stability. Now, we're not in a perfect position, and there's a lot that can be done to improve our economic fortunes, but having sustained and rebuilt our economic power, which is the fundamental base of any country's power, having worked very, um, I think, effectively with the Europeans on the Eurozone crisis, having seen China as a partner of the United States in the macroeconomic stability of the world, I think Barack Obama deserves credit. He also avoided a third war in the Middle East. He had a choice to use military force against Iran, as did President George W. Bush. Both of them decided to turn towards diplomacy. President Bush in 2006, now he was not successful in getting to the table, but he wanted to. And President Obama disregarded the calls from the right that we should use military force against an incipient Iranian nuclear program, and he engaged in this extraordinarily difficult negotiation over three years. And I think the Iran nuclear deal certainly brings us more benefits than it does risks and it's a step forward for the United States. In the rebalancing, the original term was pivot, to Asia, the idea that the preponderance of our strategic military and political attention and economic has to be on China, Japan, India, on the great growing economies of Asia, I think it's indisputable that the United States should be rebalancing and that we should find the resources to fill out our military power in Asia and that we should pursue the Trans-Pacific Partnership and see it ratified by the next president and the next Congress. President Obama seems to me correct in the strategic judgment that we're a global power, that we have to be active everywhere, but that Asia Pacific will be, of all the regions, the most consequential for our kids and our grandchildren. The Global Climate Pact would not have happened without Barack Obama and his joint venture partner, Xi Jinping. It was their bilateral agreement in, in Beijing 
in the autumn of 2014 that shamed and moved the rest of the international community, and we had been the two biggest laggards as the two largest carbon emitters pre prior to this. It was their first ever U.S.-China joint venture on a big global issue that underwrote that pact. I think the opening to Cuba, and I love President Obama's line, if you try something for 55 years and it doesn't work, you might want to try something else. That made intuitive sense to me. The outreach to President Macri in Argentina, the re-emphasis on U.S. relations with Chile and with Peru and with Colombia and Panama and Mexico and Canada means that we're looking at a Western hemisphere that is pointed in a democratic free market direction. And I think with the chronological passing of the Castro brothers and with the lack of credibility of Ortega in Nicaragua, we're seeing a, new, a newly resurgent democratic free market trend line in, the hemis in, in our own hemisphere. And finally, the two trade deals. I mentioned the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Treaty that President Obama talked about this past weekend in Hanover in Germany with Chancellor Merkel. These will be the foundation stones to ensure that global trade is codified in law and not in the power of one major Asian economy, China. It's a challenge to China to play by the rules. It's a challenge to India when it emerges from its protectionist cocoon in which it currently lives, when it understands that it has to trade more liberally with the rest of the world. TPP will be the standard that China and India must adjust to. It's so important strategically, in my view, that, they be, that, that both of these trade agreements should be passed. So I think President Obama, if you're looking at a transfer of power, and we are, of the baton passing from President Obama to somebody else whom we will elect in November, there's a lot for the next president to build on. Third challenge, third test, but I haven't talked about the Middle East yet. And after all the good things I just said about President Obama, and I, have, I respect him and have supported him and deeply admire the grace and civility uh, that he has displayed as President of the United States, I think you have to say any objective view of his policy in the Middle East would say, we have not succeeded, and in many ways we've failed. Failed to, artic to conceptualize a strategy that would last more than one through one of the crises, the overlapping crises that characterize the modern Middle East. Middle East. Failed to articulate what American interests are at a changing time. And I'm not saying this is anywhere close to being simple. Because President Obama, through most of his second term, has been dealing with a revolutionary Middle East, a Middle East that is unstable and violent and turbulent, where four of the 22 Arab states have ceased to be unitary nation states, Libya and Yemen and Syria and Iraq, where there's been a Shia-Sunni overlay of competition and of bloodshed that has contributed to a lot of these problems, where certainly we see probably the greatest humanitarian crisis in the world today, 12 million homeless in Syria out of a population pre-war five years ago of 22.4 million people. Seven million homeless inside the country, five million homeless refugees outside the country. It's not that the United States hasn't reacted, we have, but with no degree of discipline or of strategy or of patience. So what should she do? What should he do, the next American president? This could occupy five, six, seven Stanford seminars. But to be very brief, first I think do no harm. If you're in the middle of a hurricane, do no harm. Proceed <coughs> cautiously. Second, pay attention to the wise words of a very wise Secretary of State Bob Gates, when he was leaving, he said publicly, as I remember, the next American Secretary of Defense who advocates that a major land army be sent into the Middle East ought to have his or her head examined. And I think Bob Gates is a wise person and he speaks from experience. The first thing we've got to do after Do No Harm is rebuild our relationships. We're at an extraordinary time in the Middle East and we're the most powerful outside influence on the Middle Eastern countries, on Israel and the Arab countries and on Iran and Turkey, is rebuild 
all of the relationships that currently have failed between Washington and the Middle East. Our relationship with Israel is probably at its worst point since the Suez Crisis in 1956. Now I think that Prime Minister Netanyahu probably bears about 80 percent of the responsibility for that failed relationship. But nonetheless, the next American president will, president will have an opportunity as a new person, a new leader, to try to narrow the gap between the Israeli and American leadership on how we respond to these problems in the Middle East. The relationship with Saudi Arabia and most of the other Gulf states is quite poor, as is the American relationship with Egypt. And John is busy trying to resurrect and manage on a daily basis the relationship with our NATO ally, which is a consequential actor in most of these countries, Turkey. So he'll continue that work as he's doing very successfully, but the next president's going to have to focus on Jerusalem and on Riyadh and on Cairo uh, and on Abu Dhabi as the core relationships to rebuild for the future. I said to be wary of military intervention on a large scale, yes. But if we look at the Middle East through the prism of Iraq 2003, and I do think it was a failure, and say we should never intervene in any way, shape, or form at any level with any degree of force again, that would be equally unwise. Because I remember Rwanda. I was in the White House in April, May, June 1994, not working on Africa, working on Russia and Ukraine. But I remember the struggle to decide what to do. And I know that President Clinton and Secretary Madeleine Albright both say to this day the greatest mistake they made in public office was not intervening in Rwanda uh, in April to June, July of 1994. And I was involved in the Bosnia and Kosovo crises. And the major mistake we made in Bosnia is not intervening soon enough between 91 and 95 when 100,000 people were killed and two and a half people were made homeless. And we just, I think because we learned a little, acted in time to prevent the annihilation of a million ethnic um, Kosovar Albanians, Muslims, uh, in the spring of 1999. So in terms of takeaways from one's foreign service career, and the two of us have both served for the United States, we have to be wary of large scale military interventions, think Iraq, think Afghanistan. But to assert, as Bernie Sanders does, and now Donald Trump this week, that essentially we should come home and give up the nation building project, whatever you want to call it, and not use our diplomacy and military to try to intervene on a humanitarian basis to save people's lives, I think that would be a great mistake if that was the conclusion to which we came. So in the Middle East, we've got to proceed cautiously, but we can't be governed by panic or paranoia. And I do think focusing on the refugee crisis in Syria, focusing on the battle against the Islamic State, because if we can eradicate the Islamic State, at least in the Levant, you give Syria and Iraq a chance of avoiding partition, of avoiding seeing their futures fractured under sect on long sectarian lines. Fourth test, to take advantage of the positive and hopeful opportunities that are out there. The reason I cite this is because we so often as diplomats, as generals, as admirals, as Stanford professors and fellows focus on the worst that can happen that we sometimes lose sight of the positive opportunities out there. Put another way, my wife Libby, who's here not today but here at Stanford with me, said to me about a year ago, you know, when you speak, because she unfortunately has been subjected to too many of my talks at Harvard, when you speak about the global situation, you almost entirely focus on what's going wrong. Are you hopeful about anything? And at Harvard, I teach a class called Great Powers. We have 75 students. Last autumn, we had 22 different nationalities in the class. And I asked my students who come from China and Panama and the Middle East and Europe and Africa, are you hopeful about current global trend lines? Where are the positive opportunities where we can put our influence to bear to bring them to fruition? And here's the list that my students and I came up with. We should be hopeful about the possibility of major progress in global public health. If we think about the imminent eradication of polio, if certain villages in Afghanistan and Pakistan, villagers, would inoculate their kids, polio will disappear from the face of the earth. Bill Gates, 
believes that in his lifetime, and he's a young man, he's 61 years old, that, he can, that we can eradicate malaria. We've seen major inroads in HIV in sub-Saharan Africa. Our 91 or two-year-old incredibly inspiring ex-president Jimmy Carter has been working on river blindness. And the combination of capital from governments, the United Nations, and particularly from foundations in the global health sphere, and attention and focus and critical mass is doing extraordinary things around the world. America's just a part of it. The United Nations in many ways leading this effort. The NGO sector being virtuous and powerful and influential, this is a hopeful global trend line and our next president ought to put her shoulder behind it. A second hopeful trend line is poverty alleviation. And I think you all know, it's well known, in the last 30 years we've seen the greatest inroad of, of, in poverty <coughs> levels in the last, uh, in, in global history. If one of every two people in 1980 were below the United Nations poverty line, maybe one in every five are now because of what's happened in China and in India and Northeast Brazil. Focus on that. And finally, and especially here at a place like Stanford, um, to see the confluence of science, of technology with private capital, with ideas and innovation that come from this academy, Stanford University, and to see the extraordinary progress and power of scientific and technological research and the application of that research to modern economic social problems. This is an exceedingly hopeful trend and your university is at the epicenter of this. In fact, you've led the way in this union of capital, I should say the union of ideas and research with capital and with private sector development. I would add to this list our alliances. Our alliances are under attack by Donald Trump. I was ambassador to NATO between 2001, September 1st, 2001, and March of 2005. I remember the 11th of September when we were attacked. I remember the NATO allies coming to me the evening of September 11th in Brussels. The Canadian ambassador led them to say, we want to invoke Article 5 of a NATO treaty. And for the first time in history, the next day we did. That an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. And those NATO allies all went to Afghanistan with us and many of them are still there. And the great majority of them went into the very unpopular war uh, in Iraq. Those allies are with us when the chips are down. And to see a major presidential candidate essentially say to hurl a thum thunderbolt at them two days ago, at the British and the Germans and French, if you don't pay up, we're gonna leave the alliance. That's not just the implication of what he said, that's what he said. And then to say to South Korea and Japan, our two, two of our great allies in Asia, maybe you should develop your own nuclear weapons because we can't afford to protect you any longer. I think what he doesn't understand is that our alliances expand and magnify our power in the world. As a diplomat, if I would have to cite one advantage that we have over China and Russia, well certainly it's our democracy and it's our rule of law over authoritarianism. But it's definitely our alliances. China has no allies in the world. Russia, no allies unless you exclude the wholly owned subsidiary that is Belarus. Russia has no allies. We have Canada and 26 European allies in NATO. We have Australia, South Korea, and Japan in Asia. We have defense partners in the Philippines and in Thailand. And most interestingly, we have security partners in Asia who want to be our military allies. That was clear to me last week when I met with the Indian government in Delhi. It's clear, it'll be clear when President Obama goes to Hanoi, to Vietnam, in a couple of months. It's clear about Singapore. It's clear about Malaysia. We have established a web of alliances and security partnerships that are the base of our global power. To throw them away because you're petulant? Because you think it actually costs trillions of dollars to run NATO when it doesn't cost very much to run NATO at all and it would cost billions to replace NATO or to bring the United States military home seems to me to be very unwise in the extreme in thinking about American power. Fifth and finally, 
I think the most important test is to rebuild American leadership overseas. Not that President Obama hasn't led, he has led, as did President Bush, as did President Clinton before him. But I'm talking about rebuilding it from within. We're going to need presidential leadership to convince the American people that we should accept refugees, that we should honor the tradition of our refugee immigrant nation to keep the doors open and not to slam them shut at a time of the greatest number of refugees in the world, 50 million and counting, since 1945. We're certainly going to need a, a presidential leadership to convince the American workers and those that are disadvantaged that trade does not always weaken us. That in fact, if you look at the California economy and the Massachusetts economy, trade is our greatest strength and comparative advantage. And we're certainly going to need an American president to work with Congress to get beyond the dysfunction and to try to recreate in the center, right, and left of our politics in Washington some consensus on an outward-looking, engaged, powerful, diplomatic, and military presence of the United States overseas. To play, in the words of John Eikenberry of Princeton, the system operator role. I love John Eikenberry's book, Liberal Leviathan. He wrote it four years ago. And he said there is an international system. And you can see the superstructure of it. And the United States is the system operator. Whether we like it or not, that's who we are. And if the next American president can win that battle at home to rediscover public support for American leadership, she or he can meet these tests today.